to introduction to type level programming in Scala. My name is Marcus. So what's actually the idea behind type level programming? We are all somewhat familiar with types. So we know when we define a method foo, which takes a string, and we try to call it with an int, the compiler will catch it, and we can make that mistake. So this is just a simple thing, but we can also do more advanced things with the help of the Scala compiler. Currently, we are getting not the most out of our compilers. We rely mostly on simple type checking techniques like this, which is also good. I would make that mistake very, very often. So it's good that we have it, but we can go even further. We can do more advanced stuff. And as type level programmers, we want to catch more errors at compile time instead of catching them at runtime. So not catching them, but basically aborting our program. So, and this is what we are going to talk about today. So this is our problem we have for today. I'm going to zoom in a bit. Come on. Yeah. So you can see it. Um, so what we see here, we're going to uh, we're going to do a few examples, but this is the ultimate problem we are working towards. So what you see above is a custom list implementation. It's a list of ints, so no generic. It can just carry ints, but it helps like um, making the example more, more simple so that we can really focus on the type level programming stuff. So when we have two lists, the first list contains two numbers, one and two, the second list also contains two numbers, 10 and 20, and we're going to add uh, the method plus for our custom list type, and what it does, it adds the respective um, elements at their position together. So the one and the 10 is added, the two and the 20, and we get as a result list 11 and 22. So nothing fancy yet, but the problem lies in the last line. So our requirement for that method actually is that we are just allowed to um, add lists that have the same size. So here, list one is a list with uh, two elements, and we are trying to add a list with one element. And what do we get? We get an exception. And that's exactly what we do not want as type level programs. I mean, I mean you can clearly see there's a, the first list has two elements. We're adding a one element list why in hell can the compiler help us? We know even before running that code that this will not work. But the compiler can't help us here because we are relying on exceptions. We have to tell the compiler what is actually allowed, that we are just able to add two lists that have the same size. And this is what we are working towards. If we would like to sum up this in a picture, you see, these are clearly the type level programmers of our future, and they are super happy that it finally compiled. And why are they happy now? Because they can go home, right? They, they don't have to run any tests. If it compiles, we can ship it to production. So their working day has ended, and they can go home, so they are very, very happy. And to sum it up in a different way, I have a T-shirt actually matching my talk. Funnily enough, this is from the last Scala I.O. two years ago in Types We Trust. So this is the mindset for today's talk, right? We are almost religious about typing, right? Th this is the only thing we care about. We don't care about running programs and stuff. If it compiles, we are fine. So, and how are we going to do this? How will you learn? We will always look at a simple program that is uh, at the value level, actually. So if this doesn't tell you anything, like a normal program, programs that run. And then we will translate it to the type level. And we have it side by side and see that those things, it's like weird and it's a little bit a bizarre world. But still, like we can like ca carry over the thinking we have learned over the years. We just have to do some adjustments. So this talk is about not like telling you how you should use shapeless or something. This is pure Scala we are looking at. It just like should get your brain like kicked, how you need to rewire your brain to think like a type level programmer. And how we will do that? Um, so what we will learn? 
At first, we will look at the type level Boolean type. This is basically the hello world of type level programming. Then we're gonna go a bit more advanced and we're gonna look at the type for numbers at the type level. So there we will um, have to look into something like recursion. This is also possible at the type level. And then finally, we're gonna do something useful. We will enhance our list example where we are just able to add lists that have the same size. And we will make it so that just like if you add two lists of the same size, only then your program will compile. So let's start. As I said, we're gonna start with our own Boolean type, the hello world of type level programming. Um, but we're gonna start at the value level again. So imagine we would not have um, Booleans in Scala. We would have to implement it our own. How could that look like? We would define an interface Boolean. We would define some methods on it like not, or, and end. And then we would implement them. Here I chose to uh, represent them as singleton objects. So they both extend Boolean and then we just do our straightforward implementations, not as easy, and yeah. For an, if it's true, if it's like an or operation, it's obviously when we already have a true, it's always true, and if we have an and, yeah, it depends on the other Boolean what the result is. Um, the false is defined correspondingly. And yes, so this is where we are started, but we want so is this, why is it doing, I have to zoom a bit. Um, so this is how we would use it in the, in the REPL, we um, initialize two values and then we just call them methods on it. But we're gonna make that example slightly more complicated. What you can see here, the end, the method defined in the Boolean, I directly implemented on the level of the trait. And I'm, um, so I have a slightly more complicated m method to translate here, and the other version would be way too simple to, to translate. Um, yeah, and I'm um, using this rule I have in the comment above, so that B1 and B2 is the same as not, not B1 or not B2. So, so let's start at diving into the type level. So I'm always trying to display the rules. Oh, it's a little bit off the formatting, but nonetheless. So on the top you see the interface um, declaration on the value level, and below we see the type level version. So we have a C trait Boolean, and it stays as a C trait Boolean, and instead of defining a method not which returns a Boolean, we now define a type. Because we are now programming at compile time and there exists no values, we are now using the type keywords because we want to produce types because this is what we can use at compile time. So the first simple rule is to replace def and valve with the type keyword. And the not method returns a Boolean instead of the type annotation, which is a simple colon in Scala, we're gonna use a type bound, which is this angle bracket followed by a colon. So it looks almost the same, so it's basically like a type annotation for types. And below for the or method, we see how we would define a method at the type level, actually. We again use the type keyword and parameter lists are now not anymore like encapsulated in parentheses. We use square brackets because square brackets is what we use as type parameters in Scala. And again, instead of the type annotation, we are using the angle bracket here and the return type is again also this um, type bound and we return a Boolean. But this time not a Boolean value, so here we would return a Boolean value, here we return a Boolean type because yeah, it's a type. So this is how we would translate the interface. I omitted the end method for now. We, we're gonna um, do that in two steps later. So now that we've defined the interface, we are going 
um, to look at the actual values. Above you see our value level program with ports, the object ports which extends the boolean. And below you, um, on the bottom you see how we would um, implement that on the type level. So now we are not using a case object anymore, but instead we use a tray. Because again, we just produce types. We don't have any values and an object is something that exists only at runtime. So we swap out the case object by a trait and now we are going to implement those type level methods we declared above. Because what we declared here is basically an abstract type and we said, yeah, we need to define that in subtypes and wha what whatever this thing does, it needs to be a subtype of Boolean. So in this case, what you can see here, if you compare it, again, the dev is swapped out with the type and we just return true. One important distinction, and you can see that rule because the formatting is funky, that we have to omit the return type here. So we could not like write it like that and then equals true, this is not allowed by the compiler for s just uh, syntax reasons. So we explicitly have to omit that. Um, here we do the same, we could copy paste it, remove the return type at the type level and then we are getting passed in the other type and then yeah, well when, when it's false the result of the or depends on the other value. Yes? Yeah, it's a type variable and I just chose to um, do it similar like on the value level. So what you were basically asking, we are normally in Scala, we are using capital letters for type, but because I wanted to do it similar, to make it really look similar like that, I in instead um, uh, used it in lower case. So this is really a type, yes. Um, okay, so, and our true would be defined accordingly, following those simple rules. So you can see it still looks very similar. And now we're gonna go back to the interface and we're gonna implement the end. And now you can see why I wanted to show that, because now we are really seeing how a more complicated implementation looks like. And if you compare it, like here we are negating this and I find it quite fascinating that the Scala syntax really, yeah, it's almost, it's not, wasn't really intended for this kind of programming, but you can see that it's really consistent um, because it still works quite well, although it was not intended for it. Instead of this, we have the this.type. So the this here, actually refers to the insta instance we have when we are at runtime and the this.type instead yeah returns to the type of this and instead of when we want to call a um, method with the dot we are just using the hash which is like uh, language specification wise is a I think it's called a type projection and Martin said in its keynote it's going to be removed because it's somehow unsound but there will be a replacement but that's what it is language-wise. But how you can think of it is, this is how, so I return to this type, and then I'm calling the type level method not. So this thing will be called. And then we are going, going to change it, change that together with an or, and then we are again on the z calling the not method, and then we are negating the whole thing. What you can see here is a little bit shortcoming, so it works quite well but we couldn't do something like this where I have the parentheses here and doing the uh, precedence there. Um, we, we could not do it like that. We, we don't have like spaces to do that stuff. So, but here it still works. It's not an issue. So what we learned here, instead of this, we are using now this.type and we are using the hash to call stuff on our types. And we are already through with our Boolean example. So how does our final code look like? Even if you just like 
you don't look at the details and you just glance over it, you can see, oh, the structure is pretty much the same, right? We just substituted dev with type. Yeah, instead of object, we use also a trait. Yeah, and so instead of a colon, we are using that angle bracket colon thingy. And instead of this, this dot type, instead of a dot a hash, yeah, that's straightforward, right? So you can really go mechanically about it and translate that stuff to, to do something at compile time. So that was me. Here's a picture basically taken of me when I wrote my first um, type level Boolean type. And how I usually do stuff, I code a bit. I'm happy when it compiles. And then I'm wait. Is a bit disoriented. I'm gonna start my REPL to try out stuff. That's big enough, right? So we gonna start the uh, FTP. quickly go into the console. What? I have defined my stuff, so, and now I would like to call, yeah, let's try it out. Let's mm. negate a fold. That's literally wha what I did when it compiled for me the first time. Oh. Yeah, it doesn't work. Mm, maybe it's weird. It's waiting for a semicolon if you don't read carefully. Oh, and if you read more carefully, it points at the hash. Mm, what's actually going on? I mean, we're... And then I actually went out, grabbed um, just uh, out to the fresh air, drank a beer, and half an hour later I came back to, to the console and then I realized we are in, a, uh, in the Scala REPL, and what does it do? It evaluates expressions, and as Scala programmers we know, expression results in values. So, and this is a type. So, the console expects a value to, to be produced, but we produce a type, so this, this can't work in Puzzle. So, I thought I would be smart. Yeah, let's just assign this. Yeah, worked, great. But still, we don't see anything, right? So. Maybe not that helpful, but, but th then it started for me kicking in. Oh, yeah, yeah, it compiled, but I don't know actually what happened. So, yeah, a little bit confusing. But what I realized by this is that we actually need tests. So because we can't try out stuff, because we don't have a runtime to test something, we need to verify everything at compile time. So how would we do this? On the left-hand side, we have the test for our value-level program. So we're going to, like, true and false must be false. False and true must be also false. So I'm testing for uh, that things are actually commutative. And here I'm also testing the negate. So how would that actually look on the type level? Here we are abusing the Im implicitly um, method defined in the Scala standard library as in basically type level assertion. And what we are doing here is we are just calling this stuff. So we are using true, calling the n method on it, passing in a false, and we are expecting it to be false. So this is here our basically our equality operator on the type level. What it actually does, it looks if the left hand side is a subtape of the right hand side and vice versa. So it actually means that things are equal. Probably I'm not totally correct with it, but this is definitely how you can use it. So we are just trying all that stuff. Here is the commutative version because commu commutativity is a bit um, tricky at the type level. If you remember, um, Martin said in his keynote that with the current Scala compiler, if you have like a type A with B, it's actually something different as B with A. So if you swap this around and you would do th um, basically try to check A with B equals colon equals B with A, it w would not be able to prove it's B 
because this is actually something different. So commutativity is always a bit tricky at the type level. So we would test the knot accordingly. As you can see, we are not specifying specs here. We are just, I dumped it like just in my test class pass into a big file. We don't structure it and if it compiles, it works. But still, everything compiles. Do we really know it works? We also need uh, negative test cases, right? And here's the only uh, reference to a library you will see. I imported the ilt type mm, macro from shapeless. And what it does, if you look at here, we pass a string implicitly false not equals false. So this should n not compile, and it does not compile. And what the ilt type mm, macro makes sure that really the string we are passing, it should not compile. If it unexpectedly compiles, it will throw an error and then abort the compil compilation process. So this is sometimes well what we need to make sure that some things really don't work, but we have to like do this funky me macro, otherwise our build won't work. So, and now we are already pretty far in the journey to become a type level programmer. That's it for our booleans. And now we're gonna go a step further and look at numbers at the type level or how to do a recursion. Let's look at our simple value level program again. We are gonna look at piano numbers. This is a certain way to um, define natural numbers in a recursive way. So we have the uh, uh, zero case and the one implementation for that um, method is if we add zero and something, the result is obviously the other number. And now we are go gonna look at the piano number. So it's defined in terms of its uh, predecessor. So it's like, for instance, the natural number one has zero as a predecessor and the uh, number two has one as a predecessor which has two as a predecessor. So it's like um, the actual number is um, defined by the number of predecessors. And if we would want to add two numbers, we would use the um, our previous number, call the add on it, which is our recursive step, and wrap it in a piano number. So th this will then be called, if this is again a piano n, it will again call that until it reaches zero, and we have um, basically taken that other number and wrapped multiple piano n's around it until we've like, um, finally produced our number. So this is how we would go about it. We would use the zero. Here I use an underscore so we can use those well descriptive names. I'm producing the one here which has zero as a predecessor. And if I would have one to have the three, I need to wrap it the zero three times in it. Here's just a different way to define our value three. A and that's wha what I just talked about that it's really defined in such a recursive way. So, and how we would we go about it? Same thing we saw with our booleans. Um, we substitute the def with the type, the parentheses is exchanged with um, brackets, and we use those this type bound to specify the return type of our type level method. So, just those um, rules we already looked at. Um, let's look at the implementation, the zero. Again, instead of an object, we are using a trait because we don't need the value at runtime. We don't have a value. We are not interested in it. We just want to produce a type. And the implementation is, again, straightforward. We just have to omit the return type, and we are through with our uh, translation when we follow those other rules. So, and more interestingly, this is where new rules kick in. How would we translate the piano n? So here we see how we basically translate a constructor. So we have a case class here, and it almost looks the same. It's again just substitute parentheses with square bra brackets and insert those type parameters here. And here we can see how we do actually the recursion. So we are basically um, calling the constructor, and it's actually 
this here in Scala is called a type constructor. So instead of the constructor of the case class, we are just calling a type constructor. So we are calling the type constructor to construct a new type, and we can just, on our previous Peano number, which in this case is a type, we can call the type level method add, and it's really exactly the same, and we just need to follow our simple substitution rules. And it will look very, very similar. So again, let's have a look at our final code. Yeah, I guess this looks still pretty much the same, right? We can uh, just follow our simple translation rules and we are good to go. Let's have a quick look at our tests. Again, 0 plus 0 is 0, 0 plus 1 is 1, and here again the commutativity case, 1 plus 0 is 1, and we're gonna again use the implicitly keyword to just reflect those tests, right? And then we are just using the ill type macro again so that we make sure that really 1 plus 1 won't be the type 1 in, in, in this case. Yes. So, and now we have uh, basically laid the groundwork. We have seen all the rules we need. Where are they again? This is all the rules we need. We don't need more than that. And now we have laid the groundwork to finally solve our list problem. Um, yeah, so in this case, now we are not doing a simple translation. So sometimes maybe we are getting paid to actually run a program. Maybe our employer is not happy for us just writing code and it compiles. Yeah, it's hard to earn so something on top of that, right? So we are gonna combine a value level program with some type level goodness or how we gonna constrain our value level program. So as a reminder, let's look at our simple example. So we have this list one and two consisting of two elements. So if we add them together here, everything is fine. The corresponding elements are summed up. But if we add a two element list and a one element list, yeah, this won't work. It's an exception. And we're going to promote that instead to a compiler error. We can do definitely better than that. A smaller reminder how list and function languages work very similar to the um, Peano numbers. So a list is always defined in terms of a head element. So it's pointing at one element in the list and then it's uh, pointing at the tail, which is an, another list. And um, the one element list points at one element and then pointing at the nil, the empty list. And then the two element list is pointing at one element and then the tail is pointing at a one element list. So very, very similar to our Peano numbers. Mm. Yeah, this is fine. We have no more code left. So let's look at the value level program. So the one with the exception in it, which we want to remove in the end. So we are defining our int list here. We are defining this thing to construct our um, int list. Um, we are getting passed in a new element, and this is then uh, we are constructing a new comp cell, which is this, this is the name for you have a head element and you have a tail, and then when we pre this is basically a prepend operation, we're gonna construct a new comp cell consisting of the head and the tail, which is in this case this list. And then we define the plus method and the size method we will need. So, and how would those implementation look like for our empty list? So, if we add an another list, we first have to check it's our business rule. The other list must have the same size. So, we will require that the other list is actually in nil. Otherwise, yeah, we throw an exception. So, require if this. Um, Precondition does not hold true. It will sh throw an, I don't know, illegal argument exception or something, or a validation exception, I don't know. But it will throw an exception. And otherwise, if we end an empty list and an empty list, the result is obviously the empty list. And we know that the size is 0. More interesting is the const list, the const cell. So we have a head element 
and the tail. And if we want to add an other list, what do we have to do? We have to check the size of the other, the other list and our own size and make sure these are actually equal. And then we are just via pattern matching extracting the head of the other list and the tail of the other list. I just made the type annotations here to make clear that we are here. Zip plus is adding two ints, so our head and the head of the other list. And then we are prepending it to a new list. And this plus here is actually the plus operation we defined on our list because tail and other tail are both int list. So well, when I read through the code, I found it a bit confusing that this plus here is an int and this plus here is an int list. So I just wanted to make it uh, more expressive by adding this type. They are not needed. And how is the size property defined? So we don't know directly. What we instead have to do, we have to recurse. So we have to uh, one plus the size of the tail, and this then recurses until it finally um, ends at the empty list. So it's one plus one plus one plus zero in the end, and then we can determine the size of our list. So this is the flawed Im implementation. So these two require statements here. Uh, they don't feel good for a type level programmer. They are producing exceptions. This is not what we want. So let's translate it. Um, so what we do here, we still have devs here. Why? Because we want to have a combination of a value level program and a type level program. And the only thing that we are promoting to a type is this size property here. So this size property here becomes that type parameter here. Why? Because we want to tag our lists with the size they have. So a two element list will be like an int list of size two. A three element list will be an int list of type three. And this will make sure that we can't add a two element list with a three element list because they will be different types. Um, and by promoting that property, and you can see it's again a piano number, so at the, the number implementation we just looked at, um, we, uh, this has some consequences. So when we construct a new list now, we, we have to specify what the size is. So in this case, if we prepend an element to our list, we produce a new list, and what's the size of that list? It's obviously the successor of our size. So if this size is the type for 2, we're going to construct the successor of 2, which will be then 3. So if we are currently a list of size 2 and we add a new, new element, we return a list of size 3. And we're going to basically tag our, our instance, our type, with that information. You mean size hash add one, for instance? Yeah, I mean, what we could do is we could have size, then call the add method on it, hash add, and then have the number one defined somewhere, the, the type for it. So that may be a little bit. Yeah, that might be a little bit more readable as instead of wrapping it instead. Yeah, good point. So, and here we see where our type level magic kicks in to solve our problem. So what we are defining here, if we want, if we have an int list of this size, we can add an another int list, but it has to be tagged with the same size. And it will again return an int list of exactly the, that same size because we're having like two lists, two elements, we're going to produce a new list with two elements. So this is then the, m the magic. So this is where we are telling the compiler basically our rules for our type. And we're going to also look at it in the wrapper to make sure that this actually works. Um, yeah, so how does the in nil implementation look like now? 
so we are still having an object because now we want to have a running program and an int nil is an int list with size zero. So we can remove that val declaration here and if we add another list it also has to be of size zero and again the result is the int nil. And what you can see here we were able to remove the require statement in this case. Um, so you can see here when you program at the type level suddenly things can get a little bit more, more complicated. So our um, translation of the cons int list here we specify the size of the tail. Why do we do that? Because I'm saying that the, the cons int list is tagged with the size of the tail and the tail has exactly that size here. And we ourselves are an int list which is the successor of our of the size of our tail. So if we are a list which has a list as a tail with size two, we self are an int list with a size the successor of two um, element lists, and this means three. It's just not very well, well readable by by wrapping that stuff, it gets a little bit harder to read. Um, again, we define our plus method here. Our own size is the pian, the successor of the size of the tail. So we are just allowing to add lists of the same size to ourselves. So again, we are like pattern matching on it and just the implementation is exactly the same. Um, an interesting detail, so I don't know if you can see it, but here, this pattern match, if you compile that program, the Scala compiler tells you, hey, this pattern match would actually fail on input int nil, right? We are pattern matching on int list, and uh, it's a tray, and we have two things. It may be int nil or cons int list, and we are not caring for the int nil. And why do we do that? because we are checking the size and we know like if we are cons in list we are our size is definitely greater than zero so this can uh, uh, not happen because we would abort the computation here but the Scala compiler tells us and we as a program would think oh I know this can't happen I can ignore that warning actually but in this implementation here the compiler is able to prove we are saying here it's an int list but because our int nil was tagged with size zero it can infer that int nil can never ever be passed into that function actually so th this is a sign that the compiler understood what we were t uh, t telling him um, so this is our final code in this case this time it's not uh, uh, sorry uh, the structure looks a bit different, so it's not like the straightforward implementation because we just elevated some small part to the type level actually. So what we see here, most prominently this size went over here and we promoted it to the type parameter and this then had a lot of consequences where we had to adapt our return types here because suddenly these are not like flat types but instead type constructors. So gen, gen, generic types, but as you can see, in parts here it gets actually more complicated, and it's not that easy to read because you suddenly have a parameter list on the type level and one parameter list on the value level actually. But here we can clearly see that it can also help, like simplifying our code actually, because we don't rely on runtime checks anymore because we have encoded our stuff in the type system. And now, this is just me talking, so we're gonna actually check whether I'm telling bullshit or not. Um, let me think about it, so I now have to import my list type example. And we're gonna have a list x, and we're gonna go back to our example construct this two element list. Uh, you can already see, oh, the types get a little bit co complicated, right? You 
over here our int list is tagged with the successor of the successor of zero and the successor of the successor of zero is two. So unfortunately not very readable if you are like maybe up to five element list it's still you can figure it out but you, you can imagine if you have like 10 20 element there yeah, it gets a bit hairy so and we're gonna have a second list uh, we had 10 20 like that and we're gonna add it up and we can see we have in cons in English with 11 and 22, but that also worked before. So now is the interesting part. If we just gonna add, yeah, doesn't matter. It's with an one element list. Uh, oh, yeah, precedent. So what it tells you, hey, I found an int list which is a si with a size success of zero, so size one, but instead I require the successor of the successor of zero, so size two. Hey, you gave me an int list with size one, but I want an int list with size two. So, and suddenly we have elevated this check to the type level, yeah, and we achieved our goal. So this is the final code. Um, some learnings. So before I started this, I was more like of a, I had a Java-like approach to this stuff. So it was for me, yes, yeah, this is generics and all it does, you provide a type parameter to your container. Is it a list, a future, an option? So you know what's inside the container. But here I learned that Basically, types can also help to constrain your program. It's not so much what is inside, but you can add mm, metadata to your program, like, for instance, the size of the list, right? We promoted it to the task type level, and we basically annotated um, our class there. And whenever I see now, like, s such complicated types, like when you, I don't know, dive into the details of Akka HCP or something and you see that stuff, I'm not that intimidated anymore because how I think of it, there are like two types of parameters. So we are basically programming in parallel. We have one program at the value level and we have the second program at the type level. And then when I see square brackets, oh, there's a parameter list for the type level and then there's a second parameter list for the value level actually. So we are ba basically programming at both levels at once. And with those types, we can constrain our program to become more correct. And what also shifted my mind is, for instance, when I now look at the standard implementation of Scala, and we all know, most Scala programmers know, when you have a list, we have the head mm, mm, method to obtain the first element, but we know this is kind of dangerous because we might do it on an empty list and it might throw an exception. And whenever I see that, it's like forces the programmer to do a check at first and then extract the head element and it gets like a little bit wonky and you would have to do that all over your place no code base. Although you know, hey, my list always have like a minimum size of one maybe. So what I think would be better to actually have an, like a type a non-empty list and an empty list type. So where you don't have the had method at all, but instead can pass around like a non-empty list type where the head method is basically guaranteed to succeed. So whenever I see an exception now, I ask myself, how could we encode that actually so that we would not need an exception at all? Um, so this is about my learnings. Uh, I'm coming to the end. Um, here my slides are uploaded. It's like the slides and the code on one repo. I'm gonna do a tweet afterwards. Probably it's gonna get retweeted or you just follow me on Twitter. So my GitHub handle and my Twitter handle are the same. Where well, I also learned a lot about this stuff. So when I dive into this, there's a huge answer on, on Stack Overflow where basically all of that stuff, all those rules are basically explained. And then when I worked on that talk, I just um, covered a blog series by Joe Barnes. Don't know if you've heard of him. He did that basically a similar talk. We arrived pretty much at the same conclusion at very, very similar examples. And he did a 
talk on this um, at Scala days, uh, I think last year in New York, and he like, I sometimes said it's like you are in two words at once, like the normal word and the bizarre word, and he uh, does an amazing talk where he um, explains it as a comparison to Super Mario, where you are like in the normal word, jumping around, and then you're suddenly going down a tube, and everything looks different, so I really recommend you to watch his talk. I think it was Scala Days last year in New York. So that's it from my side. Question, comments, remarks? Yes? Yeah, uh, you can definitely see that compile times are increasing if you try something bigger. I I tried SAS something really big and suddenly it was like 15 seconds to compile something. Yeah, so if, if you do this recursion, the compiler has really to do some hard work. Yeah. So that should work. Th th that would be even be better, I guess. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So it's always, um, I think it makes sense, but it's always like trying out, and sometimes the compiler doesn't understand the f certain things. You you can see it's really well structured the language because those things generally work. But like, n I think no one had this stuff in mind where when it was written. And I guess like for instance with Dotty and the type level stuff that are now contributed back to the compiler, they are fixing those small things, and it's not like really fundamental problems, but yeah, nobody thought of this, and they would have to take care, but I think it would work, be because we had this type also on other code examples, right, and I think it makes sense that it would also work in that position, but no guarantee actually, yeah. Yeah, you can make them recursive, yeah. No, I think it blows up at a, s at a certain size. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So also something that would need to improve there. So once you understand this, exactly this qu question come up, Oh, when I could can do this, and I have this at the value level, do it also have? Do I also have it at the type level? Yeah. And I think this is the general direction where things are moving to harmonize it a bit more. Okay, thank you very much.